I mean, I'd never been so keen on traveling in the United States. If we have our two weeks of vacation a year, right? I, I don't, I want to leave and go somewhere that is not in the U.S. But, you know, there, you're either going on a, on a vacation or an adventure, and I prefer an adventure. Welcome to The Defense Never Rests with Morgan and Akins, your monthly dose of uncommon sense about all things legal and some that are not. Hi, everyone. Welcome to this episode of The Defense Never Rests. I am Megan Henry, and I'm joined again today with my partner, Nate Bolander. Nate, how are you today? Great. How are you doing, Megan? I'm doing great. Um, So today we have on one of my old friends from growing up, Rob Shanus, um, and uh, he he could tell lots of funny stories about me, but I, I think he refrains a little bit. But he and I have been friends for many, many years. We even went to the prom together, our senior prom. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> but I, I asked him to come on because not only is he a practicing attorney in uh, Minneapolis, um, and he you know hung his own shingle and is doing awesome on his own, but he and his family really embraced COVID and did some amazing traveling cross country uh, during all the restrictions. And I, I just thought it was interesting and I, Nate, I know you, you did a lot of traveling as well, safely. Uh, so I thought you and Rob would have something in common there. Yeah, traveling right now. I'm in Arizona right now for the, until yes. tomorrow. And we're flying home. Yeah, so I, you know, he agreed to come on and share his experiences and talk about uh, how he got where he is today. So let's bring him on in. Good afternoon, Rob. Thanks for coming on The Defense Never Rests. Um, you know, you and I have known each other how long? Uh, I can't really count. Uh, Very long time. 30 years, more than yeah. 30 years. Yeah. Ba- way back to like those awkward, uh, very awkward years, right? <laughs> At least, yeah, junior high school, I'm sure, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I, just so our listeners know, I've been asking you to come on um, this podcast, I think since March, and in March you were like, what, what would I come on and talk about? Who's going to want to listen to me? And I said, lots of people. But I really wanted to get you on because you did a lot of interesting things, I think, during uh, COVID and during the shutdown with your family and traveling around. Um, But I also just wanted to chat with you because I always like to chat with you um, and talk about like your background and how, you know, you became how you got your path to, you know, practicing attorney and like where you are now and all that good stuff. So we'll start background, though. You and I both grew up in Cheshire, Connecticut. Cheshire, Connecticut, yeah. (laughs) And I know you miss it dearly, don't you? You know, it's like uh, <laughs> Connecticut's like a s- sprawling suburb with, you know, a Boston and a New York on either side. <laughs> so I like to be near to a city. That sounds yeah. like the fanciest place I've ever heard. Connecticut is fancy and it's Cheshire. It's like, man, it's like England within Connecticut. Holy <laughs> mackerel. I mean, it is, it is like, it is like a nestled uh, small picket fence kind of town mm-hmm. nestled into a small picket fence mm-hmm. kind of state. There is a town green with the church. And no, there's not, is there? There, there so is. is. Yep. And now, now since I live in you know South Jersey, which there's no such thing as a town green. When my mom first came to visit me, she's like, "Where's the green?" <laughs> we like, do we not don't... have those out here in the Midwest either. I'm from I'm in Minneapolis now, and uh, and the one thing that is the most startling is the lack of community structure. There is no central anything. Uh, to cobble it together connecticut's cool because there's the the old post road runs through every town along the coast like literally the horse yes. road and so your church and your town green and stuff just kind of repeats itself over and over again and it actually reminds me so how was when you well i should back up so you went to school in ithaca the college in ithaca college in ithaca and then you made your way out to minnesota for law school mm-hmm. and how was that was that a, like a culture shock or a shock to your system to go from, you know, pretty much growing up in the Northeast to diving deep into the Midwest? It is a culture shock to this day. Yes. But you're there. Uh, you stayed. Uh, you know, I, I married into to Midwesternism and uh, it took a lot of, of lear- learning on my part. I'm a much quieter, more docile person uh, than I was when on the East Coast. Uh, and yeah i mean it's it's people walk more softly here like when you moved out there and you, you're you know buying a house and like picking out where you're going to live it, we just had talked about like it's it's totally different like there's not it's not like there's a center of town was that like a big change i know it was for me in jersey it was it's weird so i'm in a suburb that's 15 minutes outside of minneapolis and 
Minneapolis, when I first got here, I was like, you know what, this is not much of a city. It's really like seven, 12 square blocks. Like it's not, it's not a city in the way that I understand it. Um, and then when I lived here longer, I realized, no, it's like, it's sort of better because we have every major sports team, every theater, every concert venue, and they're 15 minutes from my house, always 15 minutes from my house, you know, traffic, maybe 20 minutes. And so I get all the stuff that I like out of a city without having to deal with the schlepping around that you will and, you know, in Manhattan and Philly and, you know, Boston. And so, uh, so there's no center of town for like my little town, but Minneapolis is the center of everything. And if you live on the other side of the river, then you'll say St. Paul is right. the best place and the center of everything, but people do not, um, they do not cross that way. You either are a mini- Minneapolis person or a St. Paul person. Nate, is that like Scranton and Wilkesbury? I, you know, I'm sure it must. It must be. <laughs> I don't. I don't know. I mean, they're both. They're they're far enough apart. I mean, they're about a half hour apart. So I don't Are know they? about that. Yeah, no. yeah. To me, I just thought they're like connected. Well, because I say NEPA, Rob, all the time. It's northeastern Pennsylvania, and I say NEPA all the time in the firm, and everyone just assumes it's this like amalgamous place in, in northeastern Pennsylvania. But it actually, it's actually what 150 miles, 150 miles. So yeah. things are far apart. Lots of woods. <laughs> when I used to tell people I was going to the city that only translates if you're from Connecticut, you mm-hmm. know, and you, you, right from here. Like they don't, first of all, they don't recognize either Minneapolis or St. Paul as the city and they don't think you're talking about Chicago either. Mm-hmm. So yeah. So you do, you have to be more specific. You know, you, you decided to go to, to law school at university of Minnesota, but like what brought you there? Like what made you decide that that was kind of where you wanted to be? uh best law school i get into yeah. that's the only that is the only reason i i am here now uh i always say that if i had gotten into george washington university that is easily where i would have gone and my life would be very different uh so it's fortuitous um i didn't know anyone in minnesota uh i brought with me my college roommate from ithaca who i picked up he was in rochester at the time and we drove here and i never i have never maybe until this coming summer on the road trip back uh, <laughs> i had no desire to drive through that much corn um yeah. at any point in time so everyone knows i mean as i said i've known you forever but um i don't know if you and i've ever actually had this discussion but when did you decide that you actually wanted to go to law school was it something that during college that you kind of just knew was going to be your path because i was totally different i never thought i was going to be a lawyer well you know meg you had other options <laughs> because you well you understood science and like could do math you know for me there really wasn't anything else in the program uh so um that's I mean uh, yeah I didn't think of anything else Uh, I probably should have you know like given more thought to it but uh my plan you know I was I was kind of going to go to law school I like the law and I like politics and then I was going to figure it out from there uh and so I what I what I could not figure out is like getting done with college and being like okay I'm gonna go get a job that that made no sense to me I didn't even understand how that would work that I was qualified to do anything that would pay me anything that resembled not living in my parents house (laughs) and just so that wasn't gonna work or in a a beautiful house in in Georgetown where I forget where you Rob and I lived together one summer uh when I was in college in this very rundown three-story home at Georgetown and I think you worked on the hill that summer I worked on the hill that was stupid too Uh, (laughs) it's really hot in DC in the summer Mm -hmm. Uh, yes we also I mean we can get in this but Meg and I worked in a restaurant where we both waited tables and I got fired from that job absolutely deservingly fired from that job so why did you get fired I didn't I spilled a lot of red wine on people (laughs) Uh, and on as purpose? a server, um, no, you, but as a did server, you undermine your own employment or what? Yeah, no, as a server, I mean, that's sort of a no no, <laughs> sort of. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I embellished my resume a bit to get that job and wasn't very well balanced. So the carrying of the trays in the one hand wasn't an ideal fit for me. But the funny thing about that is that I didn't really understand that I had been fired. So I showed up for work <laughs> the next day, and she was like, What are you doing here? And I was like, oh, okay, well, I wasn't, it wasn't clear that, you know, 
maybe something about don't come back didn't register <laughs> <laughs> don't go back till tomorrow <laughs> so you see my career prospects were, were, were narrow yeah at least you had resilience you didn't take yeah, no right. answer yeah. yeah well I, well and you also you didn't have the years of experience working at blackies that, that i did mm -hmm. that i can put on my resume that i had years no. of no no we had tables. similar we had similar culinary backgrounds that we came to that job with but you were very good at at serving and i was very bad at it and, and you know what it, that job had more to do with like just remembering so many things and multitasking. And I'm not good at multitasking. I have systems that help me with these things, but like remembering that table five want needs cream and like table eight needs to pay their check at the same time. The, mm. I can't keep up with that. So, well, you know, at least you learned early on that what not to do. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you get, you get to Minnesota, you go to university of Minnesota, um, and I mean, I guess you should explain like what, what is your practice base now so and I'm, how you got there? Cause you started at a big firm and now you're on your own. Right. So I'm right now today, I'm about 80, 75 to 80% construction law, just the whole gamut of construction law. And I do business litigation and real estate litigation when I was, uh, so I had a summer associateship uh, at a large firm here. And then I fell in with the people who do real estate litigation and then they hired me as an associate and for seven years I did basically real estate litigation and construction um, probably heavier towards the real estate litigation so title related claims fighting over people's easements um, foreclosures which I really I don't love doing mm -hmm. um, you know a lot of bank representation which I do some of but not a ton now and then um, when I got out of my own maybe in the last four years things very much shifted in the construction direction because it's such a niche that it's just much easier to mark and I really like people who build things that I can't build this podcast I mean, is all about things you can't do Rob I don't like that let's, let's, I'll let's tell turn you what I can do though let's let's, yeah, I'll, let's I can read I can read uh architectural plans a, mm. a skill that most lawyers do not have and one that I just developed over case after case and that is immensely helpful when litigating about construction issues because I can actually, for, for two reasons. One is I can understand them, but two is I can poke the heck out of my clients when they're trying to tell me, oh no, we, it was, because a lot of times your clients will say it was designed that way and you'll look at the plans and you'll be like, I'm not so sure it was. Mm -hmm. And that's really important to be able to, and then, and then they'll look at it with you and they'll say, yeah, I see your point. You know, that is something I can do. Well, and, but I mean, I think that's really important though, because it's something, you know, we all become experts and little aspects of, of the, the grander field of law. You know, when you have a case that involves, you know, uh, say it's like a, <clears throat> a construction defect case, suddenly now you're an expert on, you know, whatever it may be stucco. And then, you know, you, you just, and Nate knows this, he does a lot of products liability and he becomes expert on very random products um, to the point that, you know, he has a lot of really good specific knowledge about things that people may or may not care about, but it comes comes in quite handy during this case. Oh, yeah. And, and, and of course, an on-site inspection, we're looking at the product, you, you can't replicate that in any other capacity. And I imagine it's the same for you. Right. If you're looking at plans and you go out to the building and see it, that that's immensely helpful moving forward in the case. It is, it is immensely helpful in any, you know, law is kind of what, it's just the umbrella over which you put something right you, you need to be able to speak the language and the language you got to speak is that of the industry not not really you know i don't go talking law to my clients but i do need to be able to talk about trusses and mm -hmm. you know truss right. assemblies and stucco right and and like exterior assemblies and things that they know plus it lends me some credibility you were i mean you were at a, a pretty like i think a mid-size to larger law firm for quite some time. And then you, you decided to make the switch to go out on your own. And how, how did you come to make that decision? Cause that's a scary step to make when you're coming off of a lot of stability at a law firm say, to making the decision like, no, I think I can make this work on my own and you know right. support myself and my family. Yeah, um, well, no. I didn't know, <laughs> I didn't know that I was going to be able to support anyone. Um, my <laughs> wife was full, you know, employed full time. And I, I thought, you know, I'd, I'd sat down, I'd, I'd met with a career coach, um, trying to dive into why I was so unhappy doing what I was doing. And 
Um, and I did a ton of informational interviews with people in different fields and realized that I didn't really want to start from scratch. And then uh, I did, you know, some napkin math and thought this would work out, you know, with an, I had like a plan where I would be semi destitute for a few years and none of that had to come to bear. Um, you know, so, you know, it just was a, it's a bit of a jump, but I was super, I couldn't figure out the math on being an associate, uh, a senior associate in a large firm, switching to being a partner where I was responsible for all of a sudden developing a ton of clients and doing it at the rate they were billing me at. I didn't understand that math, how that was going to work. Um, and some firms develop their associates in terms of business development from, from more junior and ours didn't. So there was no, there was no business development. I, I'm seven years into practicing law and I have no, no iota of a clue where I get a client. And that's how I jumped off. I jumped off not. In fact, I did like little informational interviews with partners at my firm and took them to lunch. I said, you know, how do you get your clients? And many of them were like, you know, I really don't know. By the way, that's not a good look. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, know, you know, like in terms of communicating with associates, like, you know, I don't know if it was close to the vest or what it was, but I, but I thought, well, uh, that's tough. Was there, was there a decrease in hours when you switched from associate to partner? Because I know a lot of firms operate that way where they say you have to bill, let's say 2,000 as an associate. Now you have to bill as a partner 2,000 plus, let's bring in X amount of clients per year. And that's just adding another full-time job basically to your current job. Um, no, it's a, it would have been a reduction in hours. Mm -hmm. Um, the par for an associate was, was more, mm -hmm. um, than the, than the minimum par for a partner was, mm -hmm. but there was also like a, a considerable buy-in and you did not control your own rates. You know, like, mm -hmm. I mean, there's just, I, I suppose you could have insisted on a lower rate, but like it was basically adjusted across the firm. And so you, now you, you were seeking to drive clients at a, what it, would be a really high rate for someone. Mm -hmm. At, you know, market wise or really high rate. And if you don't have these relationships with clients, what do you do? You go to, the, you know, you go to these trade events, you go wherever and you say, Hey, you know, I can do this for you. And here's my rate. And it's like, okay. Um, you know, it's just, it's just, you know, and rate doesn't drive everything. Um, it shouldn't once you're well known, it doesn't in an industry, but it, you know, if you're just trying to get your foot in the door and my clients were, you know, new home builders just trying to get their start mm -hmm. i think it does matter oh for sure and then they don't right. even know you from you know john or kevin so it, and they might be like a smaller company so it's a really hard sell if you have a really high rate and they don't you don't already have an existing relationship and you're just trying to break break in um so yeah. it's almost like an impossible uphill battle yeah i just i didn't i mean i probably would have you know, I mean, 10 years down the road, whenever you look back at yourself, you like tell yourself that you could, you know, something made more sense than it seemed at the time. I mean, I'm, you know, all those lawyers in that firm weren't failing, you know, I mean, they were, they were figuring out a way to make it work and they do. I just didn't get it. Um, and I just, and I didn't, I wasn't happy. I wasn't happy working where like I would go, you know, I kind of felt like I would go into my office and do my work and then leave, but I was surrounded by all these people, but I was still feeling pretty much alone. Mm -hmm. um, as soon as, I, you know, as soon as I got off on my own, it was like, it was like social hour all the time. You're, you're constantly on the phone, you're constantly meeting with people in person, you know, like the, the, all these personal relationships came out of the woodwork that I wasn't, because I was just having my head down doing work for other people. Yeah. So that's been nice. Well, and I, I do think that it also go, goes to, you know, did you feel like the upper the upper management, so to speak, weren't really working with, you know, the younger associates to kind of help them cultivate those client relationships. Like, okay, partner A might have this really strong relationship, but they want to keep it all to themselves. So you can work on their stuff, but you're not, you're not talking to the client. You're not going to be able to develop any meaningful relationship that, you know, eventually that partner's going to retire and that's going to have to go somewhere, but they're kind of cutting you off. I didn't have that issue so much as the issue of non-cultivating the skills to develop clients. So I, got, I wasn't really in a situation where like my, my mentors didn't want me engaging directly with their prime client context for fear that I would take the client. I don't, I don't think they ever thought that I would. In fact, when I left the firm, I gave them the list of two clients that were coming with me you know, and told them I would transition all the rest for them. I had no interest in poaching. Um, but it, there was never any kind of 
in fact, there was kind of an, an attitude of, we, we just want you to do our work. We don't want you to worry about developing a book. Right. But it almost seems like it cuts, it cuts off growth, you know? And I mean, I, I yeah. will say coming in, you know, to marketing and, you know, it is extremely helpful to have someone guide you to what you what to do. I know for years, I think I was floundering. It's just like, I'll just go to this conference and try to just like talk to people. And then that two minute conversation you have with so-and-so, like it, it goes nowhere. And I, I really didn't have any real clue on how to take it anywhere besides that, you know, that random conversation, you get a card and I'm like, okay, now what? <laughs> now, how do I make this right. into something? <laughs> well, here's the two schools of thought though. Here's where I always hear it. If you're at a big law firm, they encourage you to learn how to be an excellent lawyer before learning to sell yourself. You, you need to be an excellent lawyer to sell yourself. And at a small firm, it's, you need to go sell yourself and then figure out how to be an excellent lawyer, <laughs> right? And, and both of them make sense to me. Um, the large firm that I was at was the former. It was, you just focus on being an excellent lawyer, learning how to be an excellent lawyer, and your clients are the partners of this firm. And once you master that, then we'll, we'll worry about figuring out what you have to do to earn business. But the model also did revolve around kind of that inherited client situation where like eventually you'll just grow into taking over someone's book. And I have definitely have colleagues who left in frustration because that wasn't happening. Yeah. You know, I mean, I don't know which, you know, I mean, everyone, some of this is kind of old business models that, and all others is like, why did, if you've got a certain amount of attrition from a large firm, of each associate class, how much time do you want to spend teaching them how to develop clients when they're not really going to bring in, you know, a second year associate is not going to bring in a, a whale of a client. And, you know, so I don't know, I don't know how you balance that, but I, I would have, it would have been better to have had some, I, some I, mean, I was totally guessing when I left <laughs> there and started my own practice on like what it is I do. And I did a lot of things. Yeah. So, and how, how did it work from there? So you leave and you're like, okay, I'm, I'm opening up my own shop and I'm going to hang up my shingle. Yeah. And I have these two clients that are mine and they, and like, okay, now what, like, what, what did you do? So <laughs> I what I did you gonna, do your first day of work? <laughs> I, so that's, I mean, I showed up for work my first day of work. I did. I like, you know, I went, I had my home office at the time and I went in there and I closed the door and I did a full day of whatever, whatever time I had, I either spent it working for the clients or trying to develop the website more or whatever. I set up um, like, you know, like little breakfast groups with other lawyers or people in industries to try and get them. And sometimes five people would come and um, I got myself speaking engagements as much as I could. Uh, and I set up a coffee after coffee after coffee with lawyers and what i found just to my surprise was referral sources kind of came out of the woodwork yeah people who who would not have referred something to me because i was a lawyer at a big firm people who were adversaries people who i thought hated me because we were in litigation against each other were calling me with good clients their mothers who needed help you know still happens um so i, I lived off referrals um you know, and if you're lean, you don't need that much work to like survive, to like feed yourself. Like if you have higher aspirations than eating, you know, and, <laughs> and feeding your family, then, then you need to develop <laughs> something else. But like, if your sole aspirations are like, we're going to, you know, and my wife had health insurance at the time. So oh, that helps. yeah, right. That was a big part of it. Do you have any stories of cases that you took or clients you took that you you look back and like, what was I doing? One of my, one of my best friends, Megan, you actually know Dave just went on his own. And um, every time I talk to him, he, he does will and trust in the state's work and some transactional business stuff. But if sometimes I talk to him, he's like, I'm going to landlord tenant in South of Jersey, then I'm going to defend a DUI in Philly. But, I mean, and, and I think in probably 10 years, he's going to look back and be like, oh my God, I really took some things that I didn't expect to take when I went solo. Um, so part of what I wanted to do when I went solo is try a lot more cases. And to do that, I was going to take personal injury matters. And it took me maybe six months to realize that that was not going to work as a business model because they are so they require so much kind of paper pushing you need like a full-time slate of paralegals to do and um and also like no one is going to send me their like you know six bajillion dollar truck accident case when there's all these huge guys that do this so i 
I also didn't think I was going to get the referral calls that I did get, which were basically the doing all the things I did at the firm, you know? So that's how it ended up, it ended up sorting itself out. I didn't do any personal injury. I just kept doing what I had been doing. Just changing, changing gears a little bit. So one of the reasons I wanted you to come on is just because you and, and your wife and your family, like you have such a love of travel. Um, and I was trying to think back before and I'm like, was it, did Rob always travel a ton? And I, I, I don't remember from, you know, growing up, but whether and in college, I don't even remember if you did like a, a, like an, a broad thing or anything like that. Did you always have that like travel bug? No, Meg, all the things that you love in life come from <laughs> deprivation from a, from a place of suffering. And, uh, so no, I didn't go anywhere growing up. He didn't um, suffer. <laughs> yeah, I didn't suffer, but I did, but I didn't travel, uh, certainly not robust robustly no I mean as a kid like you know up and down the kind of east east coast like my parents you know we'd go to Rhode Island we'd go to Maine for weekends and stuff but um and I know my grandparents used to take us on my sister and I on these trips for several summers which were like one we went to Yellowstone and like Grand Tetons and did all these amazing things like horseback riding and whitewater rafting and those kind of left a a mark in terms of traveling as a kid that I kind of wanted to duplicate for my kids. Like, so, and like Nate, I, one of the reasons I wanted Nate to join us is because he, he travels more than anyone I know as well. And th- Nate, did you grow up traveling a ton too? Or is this like a, a same thing where you deprived your whole life? So then you do it now. <laughs> we say deprived, like I wish we could look at our past. It's a, not actual deprivation, no. but, um, but no, we went to the shore and we went to like day trips and we went to North Carolina and things, but, the reason I started traveling with my 20s is because my dad actually never traveled his whole life until he got to be his 50s or 60s. He was always the guy, we talk about risk averse, he was always the guy who any, you know, put, put everything in the stock market, put everything in the savings, make the prudent choice, always get the roof redone, don't go on vacation, you know, never made those choices. Then all of a sudden exploded and said, I got to see the world. And he said to me, listen, you know, I have trouble going upstairs sometimes when I'm abroad, it's too hot, go when you're young. Uh, go before you're married. And so I really, you know, and I've never regretted any penny spent on, on travel ever. I mean, I've regretted other pennies spent, but I come back from trips and I, I never look at my bank account and say, oh, that was too much. I, so it's a hundred percent worth it to me every time. I know Nate ha- has this philosophy, but correct me if I'm, I'm getting it incorrect, but mm-hmm. Nate doesn't like to go to the same place twice. And not if I can you, help it. Do you share yeah. that feeling? I do share that feeling. Shelly would like to go back to Me- the Mexican Riviera whenever, um, whenever we can. And I have convinced her that we can't go because of the cartels. <laughs> and the real reason is you've been before. I don't, I don't really love beaches. You know, it's kind of a repetitive endeavor. Like, I feel like the beach is the same. And I don't really, you know, like, it is, it is one of the eternal balances of our marriage that we will find ourselves again at the beach someday. I don't know if she will believe about the cartel. Are you going to stay at a resort? or? <laughs> Hopefully she doesn't listen. You don't need to talk to her about it either, Meg. Do you, do you leave out newspaper clippings for her? Like uh, about cartel? Uh, you you know, watch, just, have, her, have her watch the movie Sicario? And... Yeah, every so often there's something in the news about how it inches closer to like mm-hmm. where these report, resorts are. But, you know, like I like those trips too. And I'm sure we'll do it again. And there's that's you know, you're either going on a, on a vacation or an adventure and I prefer an adventure. That's I'm with you hundred percent. We, my wife and I've reached an agreement where I get 5.00 AM to two. So we get that. We do the castle tour. We do the walking tour. We do the bike tours. And then we, and I, at two o'clock, I say, what do you want to do? And she says, I want to grab wine and go sit in the park. And she doesn't love the first part as much as I do. And I don't love the second part, but we need to compromise. So that's what and we And if you're reach. traveling with kids, that, that is also the, mm-hmm. the scheduled agreement uh <laughs> usually we get until about 12 30 and then they're mm-hmm. like we're we're not getting out of the car again mm-hmm. well and that's the thing like you you've gone on so many international trips with with young young children um and i i'm very impressed because the most of my kids have been on a plane is from philadelphia to florida pretty much and it's probably as much as i could bear so i mean how and I, like when did you fir- when was the first time you took an international trip with your kids how old were they if you're counting mexico they then from very young and but from yeah. here that's two and a half hours okay so that's not the the one we did that was a big one was to scotland and that was yeah. that was too so it, it would have been not this past march but the march before 
and uh and that was like we were going to just put our chips on the table and see if this isn't going to be an enormous disaster um and i kind of i'm like we're going to be in a fuselage with these people <laughs> for you know it was a i don't know it was like 14 hours it turned into a 22 hour trip by the time we'd gotten rerouted redirected and rented a car in a different city and drove in two and a half hours on the wrong side of the road at night but they did really well um and so that was kind of sealed the deal like they were well behaved they entertained themselves on the plane um you know the little guys were they were five or six the twin gonna boys yeah. yeah so and maddie maddie my my daughter is older she's now 12 so she was never going to be a concern um no she's like very mature too yeah, she chatted in Spanish with some grandpa who was sitting next to her for half of one of the flights. Well, what I've also found that, you know, you don't need, for, at least with traveling with kids, you don't need as much of a plan for them to find fun. Like, you know, they don't need to really see the destination as much as something along the way. And they might remember what's along the way much more and appreciate it much more like that. The random playground in Amsterdam, they probably would enjoy that more than if you drag them to the Van Gogh museum. Yeah. You have to accept that, that their memories are going to be of the things that were not on your plan. You know, like my kids, when you ask them about Scotland, they talk about the coos, which are what they call the cows there. That is their, <laughs> you know, and like, granted we did make stops oh they chased the sheep too in like one of those like angelic little like places that have like these rolling hills and like you know there's just free roaming roaming sheep they chase, you know these are the things i'll remember you know the castles I, I i can't tell you i can tell the difference between the castles after a while but yeah you know someday we'll tell them where they were and it's very cool mm. um i mean we have i get the same fatigue i remember you know going on you know i think i think in high school we went to Italy and, you know, you see a thousand churches and after a while, like <laughs> they all look the same. They're all, old. they're all pretty. <laughs> right. Yep. Yep. I mean, my, you know, my, for them, it happens to be that my, what I'm interested in doing coincides with what they're interested in doing, which is that like, I have no joy in going to a city, particularly I want to be outdoors as much as possible. Um, so, you know, past summer we did in national parks when we were in scotland we stopped at a bunch of outdoor kind of waterfall places where they could just kind of run around and we do it whether it's pouring rain or not and you know we bring the right gear and so you know they're they're pretty adept at if they're not too tired they'll do it do they have any places that they want to go i know meg i think megan you told me your one daughter's really into paris mm -hmm. did you have your kids have any places where they're like daddy next time we better go to x y or z uh i my daughter would like to go to paris at some point but what is it what is it with young women in paris? is it just it's, no. could you explain it to me i mean it's the eiffel tower it's like yeah. it's a I magnet hate for i hate paris well they like don't it, know but... about everything else that you know about paris like they just it looks it just looks pretty and you know mm -hmm. and, and it's on uh, you know every like shirt and stationary like that i mean it's I mean, you should see my daughter's room. It it has so she has stickers that say "Always say yes to Paris." And like, so when are you taking her? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> might she might get to go to Montreal? <laughs> oh well, French speaking, okay. You can tell her it's Paris. <laughs> <laughs> what about the boys? Uh, you know they. So we so we just did um, we just did a road trip to all these national parks and. Um, one of my sons is a big sports fan. So he was jazzed to like see every sports complex mm. that we passed and we couldn't go in any of them, obviously, but he like, he knows every sports team in every city. So like we went through St. Louis and we went, you know, and he, he was excited, uh, in Nashville. We went, you know, recently through there and we, you know, he was excited to see all the different sports complexes. So someday, uh, Owen would probably like to go to all the ballparks yeah. you know, or football stadiums or something, but mm -hmm. that is not on my bucket list. Uh, I was glad he was checking that off from the freeway. Like, there you go, buddy. <laughs> Crossed it off. Actually, we have a colleague that his, what he does with his daughter is mm -hmm. they have to ride a carousel in every state. Oh, that's great. Yeah. I think it's really, really neat that they, they have they a do lot. That. They have 30, they, 30 something. Yeah. They have quite yeah, a bit. A lot. Yeah. But he's yeah. funny because you know I'll ask him what he's doing over a certain break. He's like, I found one in Indiana. 
and they're only open Saturdays 12 to 2. I'm like, oh, oh my word, that's quite dedication for, <laughs> for her care herself. And she's into it too, which is great, because I think if yeah. she was not, it would not be nearly as fun. You, you've mentioned the the trip that you did to the national parks, and that's one of the one of the things I really wanted to talk to you about because, you know, if I remember correctly, back in you know March when everything was shutting down, you had a trip planned, I think, to Portugal or Spain. Right, Portugal, yeah, Portugal. And I remember us having a conversation. We're like, well, I'm just still hoping I can we can make it. We don't have to cancel our trip, which now I think is hilarious. It's hilarious. <laughs> we were we were watching like the blooming COVID, you know, on on the websites right like oh there's only a hundred cases there's you know like maybe we can still do it and then spain exploded and then it was obvious to anyone who was paying attention that we were not going but but then i think you guys at least made the best of it and the best of having a shutdown and the kids not going to school and you having a job that you can be very mobile and you decided to do a u.s national park tour and i think that's awesome so yeah. whose idea was it uh i think it was mine um <laughs> or do you want to take credit yeah no because we had a, I had a buddy who um who quit his law practice and got a rv and just spent a year like in an rv going around the country and i'd never been so keen on traveling in the united states like if we have our two weeks of vacation a year right i, I don't i want to leave and go somewhere that is not in the u.s but um, and like, I, let me say this, like, I obviously recognize that like this past year sucked for most people, um, and for good reason. Um, but for us, the confluence of circumstances, Shelly lost her job, which would ordinarily have been sort of a tragedy. Um, and the kids were home and we were trying to juggle that between us both working full time and it was not going well. Um, and so when she lost her job in March, because she was in kind of a hospitality industry I said like look why don't I can work from anywhere why don't we just buy an RV and then we'll sell it at the end of the year or something and we realized that RVs are not very safe for small children did you buy an RV no because they're not oh. safe for small children <laughs> <Is> that... <laughs> you can't yeah, really get a car but... seat in them there's all sorts of like <laughs> stuff with that so we <laughs> don't really apply you just fly no. out all over the place mm-hmm. so you know and I'm showing up record appearances on zoom like no one's going it so this confluence we just felt like we had to take advantage of it we'll never be able to do it again so we set out from six weeks um, and from here uh, yeah, we went all over the place. I'm actually like looking at the map of our trip right now um, and we went all over the place. And so we went to South Dakota. Uh, from, from there, we went down to Colorado for a week, um, two weeks in Utah, one, one week at the in Moab and one week near Zion and then to Yellowstone for two weeks, different parts of Yellowstone. And then we came back and we added a week to Yellowstone because I had briefs too. And I didn't want to be in the car um, when I had like seven briefs to do. That last week wasn't fun at all. <laughs> Just reminds me of college of like being in the passenger seat, writing a paper on the way back to school that you should have done over the weekend when you were mm, traveling. Right. And I get car sick. I cannot write or read in the car. Right. So it was like, um, you know, and we tried to be super safe and we stayed in Airbnbs. Um, and I think we had like one night in a hotel, which we couldn't avoid, but, um, and the timing of this was such that people weren't, uh, it was during school still for much of it. Kids were still in Mm -hmm. school. So when we got to Colorado, um, we're going to the Rockies and there was no one there. Um, a week later towards the end of our week there, it was getting crowded and they were having car entries. Like you had to have like a pass time entry. Um, and we had that experience at most of the parks, like that there just wasn't, you know, Yellowstone depends largely on international travelers, you know, people coming from out of the US and none of them were there, um, you know, so there was never any problem parking anywhere to see anything. Whereas like these parking lots are small in the national parks. Like you can see what it might be like when, it, when it's busy, like you wouldn't, you know, unless you get up super early, you wouldn't have a chance to see a lot of these things. So, yeah, so the kids, I think they had an amazing experience, you know, and the Airbnbs just added to, we had moose in our backyard in Northern Iowa, just like sitting there, um, (laughs) where like we see people pulling over for like antelope, you know, in places and we're like, keep going. We had a run in with a buffalo in Yellowstone, me and one of my sons, like got too close to that buffalo and it snorted at us. Like we've had our animal encounters 
but it's but it was it was great and you know it's uh, a lot of family time and so we would take those breaks in the afternoon we get big enough airbnb so we have our space and i have yeah. basically a portable office with me at a folding table a printer a monitor a laptop and i would just everywhere we would go i just set up my office and you know in the master bedroom and i'd be working you know, what did i do i worked from like one to like 10 most of the time I was going to say, did you, when you travel to different states during COVID, did you see different levels of restriction? I mean, some places were very open and some places were really restricted. Yeah, yeah, big, big time. So Minnesota is one of the best that we've seen in terms of following mask mandates. Mm -hmm. um, Tennessee is easily the worst. Um, we just, we recently went to Florida. We were three weeks in Florida and on the way back stopped at the Smokies. And that was almost a regrettable situation the parks are fine the town was a disaster in terms of following any kind of it has it has to do with where they believe that it's a thing mm -hmm. you know if their governor has said like hunker down this is serious then they're serious so the further south you get um generally the worse it is for following masks and you can see when you, the more north you drive the more um the more people are taking it seriously um it's like in Yellowstone, people were all wearing masks, but they were crowding, you know, mm -hmm. like to go to the restroom or something. Um, whereas, you know, in South Dakota was sort of a nightmare because they were promoting themselves as being like, quote unquote, open for business. And a few, a month and a half later, they had Sturgis, you know, it's the big motorcycle rally where they just hosted a weekend long super spreader event. Mm -hmm. um, but you can avoid these things. You yeah. get takeout and you eat in a, in a park. You know, we... We went around Custer with a very good law school friend of mine, but she drove in her own car with her son. And so we followed her and we're like on the phone talking mm -hmm. back and forth. Yeah. And we would get out and like hang out in places. So, you know, it's doable. You can do it safely, but you have to have a plan. You have to have a car packed full of food with, you know, in a cooler so that you, you don't have to, you can minimize going to restaurants. Uh, freeway rest stops are way cleaner and better than going into any given gas station, mm -hmm. you know? So if you can plan it, you wouldn't think that, but it's, it, it turns out to be the case. Mm -hmm. Well, and it was also at a time too, that a lot of things were still pretty, I feel like there's a lot of unknowns and uncertainties mm -hmm. that, and a lot of assumptions about COVID that uh, we all didn't understand. I mean, I think we all assumed the absolute worst to, to, right. to some extent. Um, so in, in a way it was kind of, I think even more scary than it is now because everyone has a better understanding of how things kind of work. Um, but at the time, I mean, some people just thought like you couldn't even go outside because mm -hmm. it could, you know, outside your house. <laughs> and we tested too. Like we tested when we got back uh, before we let the kids play with anything. When we went to Florida, we tested when we arrived there and when we got home um, yeah. so that we, you know, so that we were careful. Have you flown during the pandemic yet? No, and I wouldn't. Uh, I know people make that choice. Um, with the kids, we're, we're traveling with five people that are all, you know, gonna, you, if you, when you travel with kids, you can't keep them from touching everything and mm -hmm. like getting in people's faces and like asking them to be safe and asking them to stay in their seat. And even they, our kids are good at wearing masks, but you know, it just, we can hop in the car and uh, road trip was never kind of something I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. um, I would normally fly. And rent a car and do these things but my kids endure it really well i mean when i tell them that like we're only going to be in the car for six hours today they're like six hours that's nothing mm. you know like <laughs> nine hours gets to be pushing it for them they don't want to do that yeah. i don't want to do that um but six hours they're like mm -hmm. you know uh when we drove through you know it's so when we drove from uh, and i recommend it from colorado to utah it's like the most beautiful tribe i've ever scene but it's also super windy and one of my boys gets mm. sick mm. <laughs> um, we were stopping every 20 minutes like for him to just get out and breathe Aww. and so that was a slow roll uh, <laughs> but you know it's all about planning i think which my wife mostly does the planning yeah and so she had dramamine and she had like you know kind of ready to do these things but well i mean nate did not exactly similar but i mean i forget when was i think april Nate went down to F Florida for mm -hmm. quite some time. Yeah, it was going to be two weeks. It was two months. Yeah, we stayed with my stepfather-in-law, um, and he's got a lot of space. And 
we're in a little apartment in Philly and we said, this is much safer for us and our dogs are happier. And so we did right. that, but we, we drove down and um, it was, it was nice to, I will say this, I can absolutely agree with you that the more Southern you get, the less they care about the restrictions. Um, in Florida being probably the worst, it was just completely open, even in, in April, March, when this is first hitting. So, um, but no, that was great. And we're going to do it again, I think in the month. So. Oh, you are? That's good. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. The nice thing about Florida is, and someone told me this, it's what Florida is anything you want it to be. Mm-hmm. Right. I mean, if, if you want to stay safe in Florida, you, you, you know, we got a house with a, with a heated pool for the kids mm-hmm. to, and so like I'd be working and they'd be outside swimming and they were fine with that. And we visited my parents, but only outdoors and only, you know, like at their pool and we had, re- you know, it's the first time really, it's the first time we've eaten dinner at a restaurant where it was just like tables by the pool. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was awesome. Uh, yeah. We, you know, forgot what it was like not to have to cook. Uh, <laughs> and I, I would say I'm not doing any of these things. Like, you know, <laughs> we, we have had a pretty balanced, like, child raising relationship up until COVID where it's extremely imbalanced. Um, you know, like I'm working all the time and she's dealing with like all the school and stuff. So I think this was pre COVID that you did this, but correct me if I'm wrong. You guys went on this, that like camping canoeing trip. Yeah. Cause we're mentally ill. Yeah. So we okay. Did that so with the kids. explain yeah. this one because I saw this and I was like, Holy moly. I would never do this on my own. <laughs> Uh, never mind think, yeah, <laughs> bring my kids, children <laughs> it was yeah like i said i mean there's a certain amount of mental illness went into this so the boundary waters canoe area wilderness in northern minnesota is of all the places maybe in the world i've been one of my absolute favorites and i never went there until a couple years ago and it's in voyagers national park which is a i think it's the only national park that is almost entirely water you, you, you can't get in there without a canoe. There's no vehicles of any kind of law. There's no planes. So by the way, if you get into trouble, you're waiting for someone to canoe out and rescue you. Um, so don't, don't be stupid out there. You know, don't think like you can not wear a life jacket when you're in a canoe, right? Um, because you're an excellent swimmer, because you'll die. And, but we did, we went with the kids and I went, we had an itinerary and we had a map and we had a compass. By the way, I'm not very good at using a compass. So we got a little lost and turned around. Um, and it's all part of it. And what you do is you go out and you paddle and you paddle and you paddle until you find a campsite that's empty. <laughs> and you're supposed to find these campsites by noon to make sure you like have one. And I have never had any luck by, with that. And so we got there at six, like to a campsite and there was heavy wind. And so we were having trouble navigating. And I was in a boat, a big canoe with two kids who weren't good at paddling and we were getting all spun around. Um, another pro tip, uh, we figured out in the last maybe hour of our trip that if you take a kayak paddle and I sit in the middle of a canoe you can steer any size canoe without the kids help Mm. but learning that at the very end wasn't terribly helpful um you know so it was really hard um but you know the kids like were camping and swimming and um we had a storm one night that was kind of terrifying with lightning and stuff (laughs) so and like they tell you like you want to get out of your you know you don't want to get hit by like a big branch so you get out of your like tent and you basically stand in the rain we didn't do that we stayed in the tent. like um but it was you know i love it and uh, as the kids get older it'll get easier and we'll, i know we'll do it again and i've already got entry passes for next summer but probably not to go with the kids that sounds like a nightmare mm-hmm. yeah i think <laughs> you know i don't think shelly's eager to do it again <laughs> with the kids <laughs> there's a lot of easier ways to go camping i just it's not really appealing to me to go like camping at a campsite where like there's an rv next to you and like mm-hmm. you know it just does that's not my idea of camping um you know camping to me is like being out in the wilderness right and you know using your wits and like the food that the outfitter gives you <laughs> so <laughs> it's i don't know if either if you've watched that show alone have you seen that show alone like where they yeah. drop yeah, that's what it sounds like you just did. That sounds awful. Which is I different than Naked and Afraid. That, very different. Yeah, different show. You different. get to keep your clothes in alone or what? Yeah, yes, you get to keep your clothes. That's and good. These are people who have skills that would be really useful in this situation, but that mm-hmm. I lack, like, you know, how to start a fire with Flint. Um, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah. So well, I, we, we went uh, taking advantage of, of COVID stuff, we did go like camping, which is probably the only way you could get me to camp is during all this. And my husband did buy a, one of those Pharaoh rods. 
was mm-hmm. like, where do you think we're camping that we're not going to be able to start a fire? <laughs> My boundary was you have to purify your own water. So, and it used to be that you would have to crouch down near the water and just pump, 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 <laughs> pump, pump for like an hour just to get like the liter of water. And now they have a thing where you basically scoop up a thing of water and it just goes through a filter and like within 10 minutes, uh, oh, it's, oh no, it's a stick. It's like a thermometer. You spin around and then it's a happy face, yes. you know, on it. And that's, your water is purified. It's, it's like blue light that does it so much easier than just mm. like, um, and so the kids could do it. They got like a hang of yeah. doing it, um, you know, and they got like pretty good at you know, helping to cook and like clean up and realizing yeah. that if you don't clean up, little creatures will be your friends. Hey, I, I'm surprised. I thought you would be an, like an avid camper. I, I am. What do you mean? Oh, my, okay, my, well, my, okay. I'm just listening. I'm listening to our <laughs> guests. No, I, that was what I did growing up. I mean, I grew up in the Northeast of Pennsylvania with all woods and we camped all the time. So in fact, my, my wife and I just bought property that we're going to be building on and we're going to be camping this coming summer on the property. Just any excuse to sleep outside because you, know? you, you own it I, yeah yep, you're darn, <laughs> darn right yeah you will not be disturbed yeah yeah right so but so i i do think you know or, or do you think that you would have done any of these things at least the the cross-country trip or anything if it had not been for COVID? i mean i venture to guess it probably the answer is no you probably would have stuck to your international trips we would have done none of it because as for the camping like that's not a way that Shelly would have used her precious vacation time right mm-hmm. we, we would and we never would have had the opportunity to do the road trip because it, who's got six weeks to just travel I mean you just don't in life have that kind of time unless you're going to quit your job um, you know and while I could do it she couldn't and it didn't even occur to me you know I mean our, our vacations were confined to the time she had off and so we were like packing stuff into mm-hmm. um and if, you know, if, it, if she had just lost her job and it wasn't COVID, we probably would have gotten plane tickets to Africa, you know, or New Zealand or, you know, Chile, where she really wants to go um, and done that, especially in the winter, you flip the world, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but do you think it may have changed, you know, changed your perspective, though, that, you know, you can, you can find places you, you love and interesting places to go here, versus I mean maybe you won't be as inclined to hop on a plane next time yeah I mean I you know I I don't think I would do it during a normal situation because I can't deal I I don't want crowds you know I I I kept imagining like what these places would be like during a normal season competing for parking spaces and like just dealing with the throngs of people and I'm not sure I would enjoy that you know like just these parking lots and national parks are really inadequate to accommodate like the throngs of crowds that come in. So you're waiting in line in your car to get in. Like there's a, there's a hike in Rocky National, it's called Bear Lake. And I've done it a couple of times, always off season. You know, we were there in like March, but if you go in the summer, like when we left there one time in, Mar- in a March season, there was just a line of cars all the way down the road. You're sitting for maybe an hour to two hours waiting to get into this hike. It's not, it's a great hike, but it's not like, that park has many amazing things to see. Like Mm -hmm. the thing about all national parks is if you're willing to venture away from where most people go, the top five and get onto the trail, you will see amazing things and you will not be around people. And that's true in all seasons. Yeah. You know, it's just, people just have this must, if you have a must see list and you might, then you're probably, you're, you're missing out. I was gonna say my favorite moment on vacation my wife doesn't want to get up early because we get to some place at some ungodly time and watch the sunrise at 5 30 or whatever and she hates the whole thing and i have to get her coffee and whatever but then when we leave we see the line coming in and that's my moment where i get to finally have like i feel good about myself that we did that so early because you don't want to be waiting you know what i wonder is though so when you're when you're you know you're self-employed and you're on you know these trips or these long trips like are you able to like disconnect and say, you know, I'm taking these days off and just not, not work and take a true like vacation for yourself. No. (laughs) So when I'm planning to go on a vacation, like to Europe, I let clients know way in advance that I will be inaccessible. And what can I do for you? 
you know, before I go. And I've never had a client pick up the phone to call me during that time. There's, there's not only are they respectful, but I've taken care of them before I left. And since I'm working myself, I, I schedule things with the court so that they're not happening. But if you're going to travel for a month and a half, for me, there, there was no one place that I wanted to see so badly that I was going to dedicate it to taking time off. I wanted to see all of it. And so I scheduled around my clients. I had mediations that were full day mediations in Colorado where that was just what I was doing for the day. And I said, Shelly, like, go ahead and take the kids wherever you want to go. And generally she didn't. Generally the kids were fine, like, hang out. You know, they needed downtime. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, no, I did not do any of that. But I would, I would say, like, I would say, like, I would just schedule my meetings. So we would figure out, like, okay, when are the kids doing school? Which they were doing. Right. And I would try and schedule all my meetings during that time. And so it was fine you know you'd have a half day to go into the park usually we would try and do it in the morning um because still it's good to get in there at seven or eight to you know get through the stuff and so yeah no i didn't take any time off per se um but also your driving days right so I, I did take a call with a court uh in a cornfield in nebraska for a scheduling conference um, it was not a video call and it was quick, but like some lady, you know, who lived there was on her four wheeler to get the mail. And I kind of waved and I was just like pointing to the phone. <laughs> so that happened. I mean, I think, I, Nate, I think, do, do you, you come out of struggle with that too, trying to, to cut yourself off from work? Yeah. Like right now you're in Arizona and yeah. you've been working full, full days. You have this, I mean, and I think, but I think when you go international, you cut, you, you cut yep. it off. Yeah, that's it's tough. It's tough to cut things off. I mean, and so for me, when you're in airplane mode and you're in in Europe and you're not not near Wi-Fi, it's the best because you can't. It it forces you not to do it. Otherwise, you can you can find a way to do it. And even here, there's you know there's temptation to always be doing things. Um, you know, my wife took a couple of days off. My mother-in-law and she were going to do things. And it stinks, like you were saying, Rob, to stay behind and do your work. But you know, to be <laughs> sometimes you have to you have to. The court doesn't honor. <laughs> you taking vacation sometimes, but yeah, I loved the thought of disconnecting is wonderful. And the only place I know how to do that is Europe or somewhere else, because it forces you to, you literally can't do anything on your phone unless you go into a coffee shop, ask for the Wi-Fi, get the Wi-Fi, go, you know, otherwise you're just off the grid, which is great. Yeah, I do. I absolutely recommend. I mean, if they take some planning, taking time off and not dealing with calls is awesome. You know, over a month. I mean, I, if I didn't take a new client oh. intake, like that, that's kind of deadly, Yes. For me. And so, <laughs> you know, that, that needed to happen. Clients work needed to get done. Clients would need things in a pinch and I would make time for it, but it didn't really, I don't feel like I sacrificed. One, I have one final question actually for both of you though. So, you know, once, you know, it's safe to, to travel wherever, wherever you want to go, where, where are you going? Uh, we are talking, you know, we usually don't repeat, but we're talking about going to Iceland with the kids. Yeah, that would be cool. Um, well, we have a, um, a hotel room in Florence we couldn't get a refund oh, yeah. for for our honeymoon. Yeah, you have so, to go on your honeymoon. <laughs> so we have to go through Florence, probably at some point. <laughs> and we have a tab Portugal uh, flight voucher that we can't whatever. So we're going to fly. We love Portugal, so we may go back to Portugal. Um, and my wife and I also want to go to Croatia. It's also on our list. So, so you're both uh, breaking I, your rules, kind of. Well, I've never, been to- yeah, <laughs> I've never been to Croatia. Oh, yes. Yeah. But- I do think, Rob, though, that it's going to be, be as soon as international travel is allowed again, it's going to explode. And I think there's going to be about six months of you don't want to be anywhere because every flight's going to be packed. Every, I, I, I may wait. I mean, I may try to do something domestic till next year or whenever this opens up because I think you're not going to want to go to the Eiffel Tower or the Coliseum landing for a year. People will be so pent up and want to get out. I think you're probably right. Uh, in fact, she- Shelly, Shelly kind of wants to get tickets like now for then, and I'm not sure that. Um, mm-hmm. I'm not sure we want to do that for the reason you just said. Well, Iceland might be a good but good choice though. That's if you true. go to Northern Iceland, yeah, you know, then it probably makes sense. Southern Iceland is where all the must sees are, and so they would they do get crowded. What about you, Megan? Ever you're asking the questions? Where do you want to no. go? I say, here's a plane ticket. Go anywhere. Where would it be? Well, am I going with my kids or without them? <laughs> <laughs> you pick your chief travel partner and you pick the place i mean uh, frankly i my i was we were supposed to do this paris london trip uh two years ago that didn't happen so that's probably our our number one but honestly we'll probably end up at universal studios before anywhere else mm. <laughs> because there is a deep yearning to 
go see some Harry Potter mm-hmm. rides. I love Disney. I mean, I do. You know, there's definitely a place for those theme parks in the oh, yeah. like canon of places to go. Universal Studios sounds. Like I always want to go to the Harry Potter one. Too. I mean, I will say we we, we were just talking about it uh, the other day about uh, Montreal because it. You know, I, I don't know if I'm ready to endure that long flight with my kids just yet. And I feel like Montreal could be like, hey, look, they're speaking French. Just pretend. And there's such great food and everything there. Even though I've already been there, I would really like to go back. So, and it's it's only an hour and a half. <laughs> I'm not as adventurous as you guys. Mm. <laughs> um, well, Rob, I, thank you so much for, for coming on after me begging you for almost a year to join us. Um, But let ever, you know, we have a lot of listeners, even some in Bulgaria. So let them know where they can, you know, they can find, find you and your firm in case they have any need (laughs) or they have friends in need. Sure. It's capstone law. So just capstonelaw.com. You'll find me here in Minneapolis. Happy to help. Well, thanks so much. Yeah. Thanks thanks, guys. Glad to, glad to do it. Mm